Good evening, everybody. This is Coach Carol. I'm delighted to be here with Chris Betcher, or Betcher Boy, for our keynote this evening called Conversations for Change. I'm going to uh, introduce Chris in a moment, ask him to describe some of his background. He knows himself better than I do. But let's go through our usual process of having a look at our sponsor's slide because we do need to mention these in each occasion because we're really grateful to all of these people like Blackboard Collaborate through our association with Steve Hargett and at the Learning Revolution Project. Because we've had 40 plus sessions and sometimes concurrent sessions and that means a separate room for every session, so a separate recording. Of course, the team behind me, beside me, and holding me up at times from the Australia E-Series. And Anne, I'm sure, will be joining us in a moment. She's done an amazing job. She's just finished her presentation. Shambles and I have been delighted to be beside you in support. And of course, we have our sponsor from Cyber Academy. Thanks awfully to all of the volunteers. Give yourselves a round of applause, a pat on the back, and a chocolate. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. You've got your slide saved already. A glass of wine. Yes, let's do that. That would be nice. <laughs> so in our final keynote, we'd love to see where you're from. I know the iPadders can't do it, so we'll have someone put a smiley in place for you. So this is what I did earlier today, I said put a smiley where you are and put a map of the world where you'd like to be. I'd like to be over here in the UK. <laughs> and if you're unable to mark your place on our time zone map, just key into the text chat and tell us where you're at right now. And maybe you'd like to say where you want to be as well whilst you're there. So I think this is an amazing way of connection and we want to be able to connect with you not just for the conference but afterwards as well. So we've got a new network of friends. <laughs> You'll love where you are Katrina, that's nice. I'm up here in the northeast of Victoria and um, it's been a beautiful day. And here's Anne, wonderful to have you with us Anne. Uh, Anne's been helping Chris in the background and I'm sure she'd like to say a few words when she gathers her breath. So let me just move to the first of Chris's slides and I'll get Chris to introduce himself and then maybe you'll ask Anne if she'd like to jump online just for a moment. So Chris, over to you. Um, hi. Um, hi everyone, thanks for dropping by. Uh, my name is Chris Betcher. I'm a teacher. I teach in uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, I'm actually a tech integrator, um, but my background is as an art teacher, um, and 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 I love working with kids and technology and ideas and making the world a much more interesting place. And you do. You have made amazing changes. I like the new title, tech integrator. I hope I've got the right title. <laughs> so, and well, technically, that's so, my title, yes. All right, okay, gotcha. And are you able to use your microphone? Have you got any voice left? Come on and uh, speak to us just briefly. Hello, everyone. Yes, I have a voice, but I haven't got my glasses, so I left them on. So I've gone to the chemist and got another pair, so at least I can see reasonably well. So thanks, Chris, for coming on board. Um, Chris is very much used to presenting at face-to-face -face conferences. So presenting in a room like this does present its challenges. So I know we suggested that Chris would be able to give us some questions to think about. Um, but I know I follow Chris's work closely. Your blogs are always thought-provoking and Chris has been very generous in sharing what he's learned and his experiences. So thanks Chris for um, being part of our closing keynote and such a crucial of it. Thanks, Anne. Much appreciated. Uh, well, shall I get stuck into it then? 
Um, guys, I really, like uh, Anne said, I, I'm used to presenting to people in person. I'm used to making eye contact and uh, and all that. And so it's, it's kind of a, not my preferred option to be presenting in a, in a room like this, but um, let's see how we go. Uh, use the yeah. chat, okay? So um, please uh, give me some feedback. And you could use the video if you'd like to. Um, have you got a webcam? I do have a webcam. I don't know what the bandwidth is going to be like. No, we'll, we'll be fine. No. It's fine. Okay. Uh, but uh, just feel free to lob stuff into the chat there. I love uh, reading the comments as we go along. Um, I try and think on my feet and read at the same time. We'll see how we go. Uh, all right. Now, I've just thrown a few slides together for this um, little talk this afternoon. And I'm, I'm just throwing ideas out there, really. I, I don't have any answers. I have a few questions that I'd like to pose. And I guess uh, it's kind of revolving around this idea of babies and bathwater. Um, you've all probably heard the expression, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that is, you know, when you, when you throw out something that needs changing and you accidentally throw out something really good with it. Uh, and I was trying to think about education a bit like that. Um, there's a lot of talk at the moment about change in education, about the things we need to, you know, reinvent and, and redefine about the way schools work and the way education works. Uh, and I do often think, uh, I hope we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I hope we don't get rid of some of the really good stuff that currently exists in our rush to sort of, you know, adopt a whole bunch of new stuff as well. Now, having said that, I think we need to adopt a whole bunch of new stuff. I think there's a whole lot about school that is um, fairly broken or needs fixing. But um, I just want to sort of toss that idea out there about the, this baby in the bathwater. It's interesting when you start to have a conversation about learning and about education and about school because everyone comes at it with a slightly different perspective. Um, this is a map that I found online of all the different learning theories that exist out there. And you can see if you look on there, you see things like constructivism and constructionism and, um, oh gosh, Skinnerism. And there's sort of, uh, you know, uh, Illich and the de-schooling movement. I can see Hargraves on there, the Montessori movement. There was Dewey, Vygotsky. So all these different people have different views about the way education works and, and, and the underlying principles behind it. Uh, and in some sense, talking about education is a little bit like talking politics, because if you have two people on different sides of the spectrum trying to have a conversation about the same thing, they will fundamentally be at odds with each other about uh, the way they believe the world should work. And so it's always a sort of a interesting thing trying to have a conversation about, uh, about education because we do have those different perspectives. So I don't know where you are on that perspective, um, but just bear that in mind as we move along here. One of the most influential thinkers that I've come across in, uh, in my sort of educational career is this guy, Seymour Papert. And I love this quote. This quote changed a lot of things for me. Um, and I don't know where he got it from. I think it's from the talk he gave. Uh, and he said, we need to produce people who know how to act when they're faced with situations for which they were not specifically prepared. And I think that's such an incredibly powerful statement uh, that that's what we're about. That's what we have to do in schools. It's not about getting kids to pass tests because when they leave school, they'll get some similar tests like it. It's about get, getting kids prepared for things that don't exist yet or that will be outside the scope of what we've prepared them for in school. So I think that's our mission as educators, regardless of where you might sit on that spectrum of um, you know, different educational philosophies. So if you start to think about schools, a couple of questions raise up for me. And there's, there's three kind of core questions that I'm wondering. And that is, what things should we keep? So if we go back to the baby and bathwater analogy, what are the things that are really worth keeping in education? The second question I think that follows that then is, what are the things we should get rid of? So clearly there's some baggage inside uh, schooling and education. and like there's, there's a few things that I think most of us would agree that probably need to get rid of. So what are they? And the third question that I think comes from that is, what things need to change? What, what have we got that we don't want to get rid of, but it perhaps needs to change and be, become slightly different? So I'm going to ask you to put some things in the chat there. And maybe if you uh, preface your comment with a K for keep uh, and a, um, uh, what was the word I used there? Uh, how about D for dump and uh, C for change? So Katrina says we need to keep, keep teachers. And I couldn't agree with you more, Katrina. 
I think we are the part of the, the process that really helps make the whole thing work. We need to keep innovation. I think we need to get some innovation in places. What else do we need to keep? And what do we need to get rid of? Dump attitude. Yeah. I'd like to expand on that a little more if you don't mind. And by the way, it's a small but intimate group here today, so if you feel you're, like you'd like to actually speak, I'm sure uh, Carol would be more than happy to hand you a microphone. Uh, dumping narrow-minded teachers, dumping resistance or reluctance to change, dumping fearful, tentative and negative attitudes, dumping negativity towards education. Interesting. Okay. It's interesting that the, the, uh, the stuff you say we should keep is all the human stuff, the teachers, the, the innovation around teaching. I think that some of the things we need to keep is things like the connections and the humanness, the, um, the relationships. Uh, the, 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 the magical interplay that happens between a teacher and a student in a classroom. I think they're the things we need to keep. The things we need to dump, I'm with you on that, I think the things about negative attitudes, reluctance to change, narrow-mindedness, doing things the way we've always done it because it's the way we've always done it, I think those are the things we need to, uh, to get, get rid of. All right, thanks for your thoughts there, guys. I'm going to keep moving on. So I'm going to share a little personal story with you. And I apologise if some of you have maybe heard me say this story before, but um, do you want to know what this is on the screen here? There's a picture of something. Anyone seen that before? I'll give you a moment to type. I see some question marks. No, okay. Ah, thank you, Keith. And thank you, Carol. Yeah, it is. It's called a Coolgardie safe. And it's a, uh, an invention that was invented in Outback Australia in the Coolgardie region of Western Australia. And you can see at the top of it there's like a pot that they fill with water and there's a tap underneath that. And the tap drips down onto the uh, hessian of the, um, of the box and becomes damp. And then as the dampness of the hessian evaporates, it creates a sort of a cool chamber inside. And they use it to keep food cool. And obviously it's not a refrigerator, it uh, doesn't, doesn't freeze things, but it keeps things relatively cool compared to the hot outdoor temperatures. Now, when my son was in year three, he was doing a unit of work uh, when he was a year three student on keeping food, um, in, uh, keeping food safe. And the teacher was teaching them about the cool guardy safe. Now, around the same time, we used to do a lot of camping as a family, and so we'd go camping on the weekend, and one of the things we'd do is we'd arrive by a river somewhere, and usually it was a creek, and it was, the water was often quite cold, often a couple of degrees off, off zero, and we'd get the beer out of the back of the four-wheel drive, and we'd put it in a string bag, and we'd toss the bag into the river so the beer stayed in the river to keep cold. Now, one day I turned up to school to pick up my son, and he was in tears. And he was, well, very upset. And I, I said, what's the matter? What's, what's going on? And he said, oh, I was in trouble today. My teacher was really upset at me. And so I went inside and saw the teacher, and she was quite indignant. She said, Mr. Betcher, I, I hope Alex has told you all the things that he did today. And I, I thought the kid had killed somebody. I thought it was like major, you know, something's gone wrong. Uh, and it turns out that in a test that she gave the kids about this work that they'd been doing on keeping food safe, um, the question was asked, how can you keep food cold? And so Alex's answer was, you can put it in a string bag and throw it in the river. Uh, and the teacher just went nuts about that. He, she thought he was being foolish, he was being um, just stupid, giving stupid answers. And you know, I had to explain that no, that actually is what we do as a family, so that's where that answer would have come from. But you know, the sad thing about that is that the experience that um, my son had with that turned him off school forever and he started to really hate school because he was a lateral thinker and so he was, it really affected him, this thing about this teacher going off at him about trying to give a, an interesting or creative or a different answer. He didn't want to be like everybody else and yet he was sort of beaten down with this idea that no, uh, you need to give us the answer we're expecting. It is a sad story. Um, and some of you may have, when you went through teacher's college, you might have heard this expression, don't smile till Easter. Um, so you might put your hand up if you've ever heard that expression. Um, and I remember being told that when I was at teacher's college, that you know, if you want to 
control your classroom, what you had to do was don't smile until Easter because in the Australian school year, of course, starts in January and they say, if you smile any time before April, the kids will have it over you. They'll be, um, you know, you won't have discipline, you won't have control. Uh, and I thought it was a pretty awful thing that, you know, the only way you could sort of have any um, managed experience in a classroom was by being basically a jerk until Easter. Uh, so I, I didn't really like that idea. And the thing is, I, it really bothers me that I think that top picture there is that's how schools tend to see things, whereas the bottom picture, that's how life tends to see things. There's an enormous amount of messiness to life, and, and I don't know if that always comes across in schools. Schools want things to be in nice little packages where we put students together in the same year group because they happen to be born between you know, two Decembers, and, and you know, we ring a bell and they all go off for lunch at the same time. And, and school is a very managed environment, and I get why it needs to be like that because you know we've got to make this thing work. We've got all these little individuals, and if we just let everyone be an individual, gosh, it'd look like the bottom picture. But the bottom picture, that's how life really is. And I don't think school should feel like this. I don't think school should feel like that. I love this picture, you know, this egg and the chicken's been in there counting the days like it's about to get out of jail and then it can't wait to get out. And I just don't want school to be like that. Um, I just think it shouldn't be. I got to meet this guy uh, a little while ago. You're all probably well aware of Sir Ken and you've heard him give his famous speech uh, about schools killing creativity. Uh, and I got to meet Ken at one point and we had a little chat about creativity. Uh, he's a nice guy. Um, and this idea of creativity is, I think, a really fundamental uh, underlying change that needs to happen in our education system. Now, I come from this as a perspective of an art teacher, but I'm not talking about creativity as being simply something that art teachers do. It's not about drawing and painting and singing and dancing, although that certainly is creative. Um, creativity it can be embedded into everything we do in schools if we just know what we're looking for. It's pretty scary that if you go into a class of first graders and ask them are they creative, they'll all say yes. They'll all jump in, up and down and tell, tell you how creative they are. You might put in different words to that, but basically little kids know they're creative. If you go and ask the same class, uh, a class of 10th graders that same question, you often get a very, very different answer and, and a lot of uh, older students don't see themselves as creative. They don't see themselves as um, having that sort of creative work. And it really makes me wonder that what have we done to these children in 10 years to take them from believing they're creative and they can do all sorts of amazing things to really wondering whether they can. You may have heard of a company called IDEO. Uh, it's, a, it's a design company, one of a very, very famous design company. This is a little test, they not test, but a little sort of uh, creative activity they give to people. And you might like to do this with your students. You simply get a piece of paper and put a series of circles on it like that. And, and you ask the kids, you say, how many round things are there in the world? Um, yeah, and I see, see Katrina's there mentioning this thing about the 5,000 uses for a paperclip. 5,000 uses for a paperclip in kindy, less than a few hundred by year six. That's very interesting. So uh, if you give um, people a piece of paper like this with a whole bunch of circles, and you say to them something like, you know, the world is filled with round objects. You know, think of everything in the world you can think of that's round. How many round things do you believe there are in the world? And people will tell you, well, it's almost unlimited. You know, there are, there are millions and millions of things that are round. So you give them a piece of paper like this and you say, okay, start drawing some. Turn that first circle there. Uh, actually, can I get my pen? Let's see if I can make square. Turn this first circle. Uh, can I get a pen? Get that first circle and maybe just do that and turn that into a, a tennis ball. And I'm going to get the second one and turn it into a smiley face. And I'm going to get the third one and I'm going to go around the outside, excuse my bad drawing, it's hard with a mouse, and turn that into a sun. And I'm going to get the next one and turn that into um, a bicycle wheel. Okay? And if you say to someone, just keep doing that, just keep turning every one of these circles into something that's round, it's amazing how quickly people run out of ideas. Um, even though we know there are millions of round things out there, they kind of like, they get a few and they, they go, oh, I'm, I'm out of ideas now. So yeah, I, I, it is a fun collaborative exercise. Um, would you like to play too? Sure. Grab a pen, 
turn one of those circles into something that's based on a round object. So over in the little toolbar on the left-hand side of the screen there, you'll see there's a pen tool. Grab it, pick a circle, draw something that's round. I'll give you a moment. And the thing is, I've done this a few times with people, and it's really interesting. Some people will fill the page, or they'll have to say they're rare, and most people start to peter out about halfway across the third line. Some people only get four or five or six circles done. And um, it, I just think it's an interesting thing that even though you know we know there are lots of round things there, we, we, our creative juices kind of stop flowing after we've done just a few. Uh, I'm going to keep moving on, guys, because I've got a bunch of slides here. So I, I'm not being rude, but I'll, I'm just going to keep motoring, so if that's okay with you. This is really um, one aspect of a creative process. This is certainly not the only one. This is um, where you start with an idea and you think of um, what else could I do? So you, you come up with an idea, like a round circle. Uh, what could you do? Well, here's another idea, and there's another idea, and there's another idea. Oh, and that idea gave me another idea, and another idea, and another idea. Oh, and this idea gives me a really wacky idea. And then you think, well, what if I do this? And then you're off in all sorts of different directions. And that's really kind of how the creative process works, is just allowing your mind to wander from idea to idea to idea to idea. Um, and it's something we surprisingly do very little of in schools. Uh, I'm doing a little project at the moment. Um, uh, I'm doing a daily blog post called uh, My Daily Create, uh, and I've done uh, a daily photo process, a daily photo project a few times uh, where I take a photo every day for a year, and some of you have probably done the same thing. This year I thought I'd mix it up with something different and do just something, anything creative every day. Uh, and so often it's a drawing or a, a, a poem or I'll write a piece of music with GarageBand or I'll make a video and post it to YouTube or whatever, whatever. But I'm really interested to see how far I can get through the year and still keep coming up with something new every day. Um, so that might be a project you can uh, have a bit of a think about, maybe get your kids to do something like that. I actually do a project with my Year 11 students, um, and it's a weekly create, and every week I get them to create something different. Um, it's, it's quite a liberating thing. They say they enjoy it a lot. Um, so creativity. It's an interesting idea. Um, if I started saying creativity is, in the chat for me, can you just finish that sentence? And you can write down as many variations as you wish. Creativity is. And Carol says liberating structures, which I assume is your response to that question. Making something original, says Keith. Opening the mind, says Juanita. Carol says, my pitch on the world, whatever I think it is, unlimited, fun. Interesting, keep the responses going. I'm going to flip to this next slide, which has a few other ideas there. These are some other suggestions that I found about you know, people's definitions of creativity. Um, you know, creativity is doing the same thing over and over again, but making it fresh and different each time. Creativity is adapting the rules to suit the situation. Creativity is allowing the mind to roam freely. Creativity is daring to be different. Some of the ones you're putting in the side there is uh, using the brain to innovate. Creativity is something new. Creativity is opening new boundaries. So there's lots of different ideas about what creativity actually is. Um, I thought this was a lovely quote from the late Steve Jobs. Creativity is just connecting things. When you ask a creative person how they did something, they may feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. It seemed obvious to them after a while. That's because they were able to connect experiences they've had and synthesise new things. And some idea of synthesising, I think, is really interesting when you start to take ideas from all over the place and come up with something new. And you may have heard this quote as well, which um, Steve Jobs <laughs> once plagiarised, uh, good artists copy and great artists steal. And the picture on the left there is actually from an um, a, a African mask. And... Picasso, Pablo Picasso, actually um, saw some African masks back in the, the uh, early part of this last century and thought they were amazing. He loved the design of these ancient masks and, and he used those designs to, uh, to sort of change the way he approached artwork. 
and use the lines and the shapes and the sort of the, the, the geometric shapes involved there. And that evolved into a style of painting called Cubism. And you can see the painting on the, on the right hand side there, Demoiselle d'Avignon by Picasso. And you can see the influence there of the masks on the painting. And the, the influence of the masks in the painting were also influencing the other parts, the bodies and the, the way he represented the sheets and the, the fruit on the table. So it's, it's about taking an idea and allowing the idea to morph into something else, which morphs into something else, which morphs into something else. And that's, that's this idea of good artists copying, but great artists stealing about taking ideas and making them your own. And uh, just while we're talking about Picasso, he's another great example of something Picasso did where he was wandering through, uh, I think, somewhere in Spain, and he, because he was Spanish, of course, and he saw an old bicycle. And so he took the bicycle seat and the bicycle handlebars and simply put them together and made a bull's head, which was interesting on a whole bunch of levels, not, not least of which is the fact that the bull is the national symbol of Spain, of course. So um, this is this idea of creativity, just taking ideas and letting them morph into new ideas. Um, I thought this was interesting. Uh, there's a brand of condoms called Trojan, and someone's there turns into a lovely little sculpture here with a Trojan inside a Trojan horse. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of cute. Um, the idea of keys. We talk about a typewriter having keys. So what would happen if the keys on the typewriter were somehow mixed up with the keys on a piano, what would you have? So, so there's a great example of you know, the creative idea, just smushing two things together like that. In fact, you know, this idea of smushing ideas together, it's, it's actually not, not new. And, it's, and as much as people would like to sort of say that uh, you know, we, it's stealing ideas, I love this quote from Alex Kaczynski, who's a judge in the US Court of Appeals, where he says, overprotecting intellectual property is as harmful as underprotecting it. Creativity is impossible without a rich public domain, and overprotection stifles the very creative forces it's supposed to nurture. Nothing today, likely nothing since we tamed fire, is genuinely new. Culture, like science and technology, grows by accretion, each new creator building on the works of those who came before. Now, when Kaczynski said that, he was actually um, making a ruling in a case about some copyright issues. Uh, but I think the, the, the underlying idea of what he's saying there is, you know, as much as we might like to say we come up with interesting, uh, with original ideas, there's very little that's actually original. It's nearly always building on the past and building on the ideas of those who've come before you and, and allowing them to morph into new things all the time. And when you start to have this conversation about, uh, about co uh, creativity in education, you know, the, the question always comes, people go, well, what, where's the rigor? Where's the rigor? It's all very well to be singing and dancing and sort of you know, holding hands and singing kumbaya, but where's the rigor in education if we start to get into all this airy-fairy creativity nonsense? Well, there's some interesting thoughts about that. Oh, <laughs> the conversion's made a bit of a mess of this slide. I apologize for that. Um, Google do a thing called 20% time. Uh, and that's where they get their engineers, uh, they give their engineers 20% of their time to work on their own personal projects. So for example, if you're an engineer at Google and you're working there five days a week, it's probably more like seven, but let's say it's five. Um, one of those days, you can just work on anything at all that interests you. It doesn't have to be directly related to your job. It just has to be something that's interesting to you. Now what's interesting about the 20% time thing is the ideas and the products that have grown out of people's 20% time actually account for 50% of Google's revenue. So 20% of the time is, I guess you could call it playtime or tinkering time or experimenting time, but it returns 50% of revenue. So in that case, is allowing people to be creative and just uh, have, have some fun and experiment a little bit. Is it worthwhile to Google? Absolutely, you better believe it. Half their revenue comes from allowing people to do that. Um, Tim Brown, the founder of IDEO, that design company I, I mentioned before, you know, he once said, it's, it's not either or, it's and. You can be serious and play. So it's not about playing or being serious. And I see this all the time in classrooms when you hear teachers say the things, things to kids like, um, you know, when you finish your work, I'll allow you to have some play or I'll allow you to sort of have some fun once we get rid of the, uh, get through the serious stuff. And it shouldn't be like that. The work and the play are the same thing. Um, there's a, a great 
analogy that I heard once from Mike Anderson, who's a New Zealand principal, um, and, and uh, I'd like to credit Mike with this because I think it's a great idea. And that is this idea of school as being less like who wants to be a millionaire and more like Mythbusters. So if you think about watching Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you know, they, they ask a question and they hope you know the answer. And if you know the answer, you get a reward, and if you don't know the answer, you get penalised. Whereas Mythbusters is more about giving really interesting uh, questions based on curiosity and saying what would happen if, and allowing the exploration of ideas through people exploring you know, their, their, their passions and their interests. And I just think school should be a whole lot more like Mythbusters instead of who wants to be a millionaire. And unfortunately, a lot of schools are still like who wants to be a millionaire. Um, these are a few slides I just want to share with you that come from, I think most of these came from a guy called, uh, uh, um, oh, his name escapes me now. Um, it'll come to me, it'll come to me. But these are um, uh, writing prompts. And so the idea is teachers create these and they share them with the kids as ideas for starting um, the thought process. So. I like this one. What should it cost to rent your school for the weekend? Explain your thinking. Now, that's a very simple statement. And just in that one and a bit sentences, you can unpack that into some enormously deep thinking that looks at the idea of value, what's time worth, what's, what's real estate worth, what's, what's um, you know, what are the different factors you need to factor in here? Is there security? Is there parking? Is there cleaning? Um, what and what would it cost? I think you can unpack a really simple statement like that into something really, really deep. What about this one? You've been captured. What do you hope this document says? And of course we don't know what's in that document, but what if you had to write about what that document might say? Well now we can have a whole discussion here about human rights um, and, and you know the sort of uh, political aspects of, of prisoners of war and all sorts of things around this idea a very simple statement just triggers it. And that's what I'm talking about here with creativity is it doesn't have to simply be some guy with a paintbrush. It's about allowing um, simple statements to generate much more complex thinking, simple ideas to generate more complex thinking. Here's another one. What's the best fruit? <laughs> Explain your choice using this chart. Now, this is not a Googleable answer. You can't go and look this up on Google. You have to have an opinion and you have to be able to justify your opinion and there are no right or wrong answers. Or this one, I love this, tell this story. It's a Facebook post. Please don't post any photos from last night. Okay, I'd like to see what happened with that one. Or this one, this graph shows a number of breakups throughout the year according to Facebook. Examine the graph and write one paragraph of relationship advice. So much you could pack into that one. And yes, Anne, I think you're right. The kids could have some really interesting answers to, to a lot of these things. Um, these are not difficult to make, by the way. If you just Every time you see something on social media or if you just browse through Flickr for interesting photographs, you can take all sorts of interesting ideas and then simply with the right phrase, with the right sentence or question to trigger thinking about it, you can create some really interesting prompts. I love this one. Tell this story. <laughs> And it's got the plane there with all the arrows sticking out of it. I would love to read that story. Um, some of you might know Dan Meyer. Dan's a mathematician or a math, math teacher. Um, and he he uh, is currently doing a PhD in, at Stanford uh, in maths education, looking at the different ways we teach kids to learn mathematical ideas. But one of the big things that Dan always talks about is giving kids less information. So, for example, there's a problem here. I wonder if this is going to work. Uh, no, it's not going to work, okay. If, if you sort of, um, sorry, in the original slides they had an animation on this. If you take all this stuff out and take all this stuff out and take that out, if you don't give kids that information, if all they have is just that question, how long would it take for the water to fill the container, and they don't know all this other stuff, this becomes a far more interesting problem and a far more open-ended problem and encourages much more creative thinking about maths. Because now the kids have to think, well, um, I don't know, how long would it take to fill the container? Well, um, I guess we need to know some information. So then they have to start digging what information they need and they have to figure out how would you get that information. And 
And there is so much packed into a question when you take out the stuff that they know. If we give the kids the rate that the thing drops and what the size of the diameter is and how tall it is, then all it involves is plugging numbers into a formula. That's not creative thinking. That's just simply rote learning. That's just plugging numbers in and hoping that we do the maths the right way. Giving them just a question is a far more creative approach to that. Dan talks about this idea of bored, confused, engaged and perplexed. And I, I keep hearing teachers talk about this idea of engagement. You know, I want my kids to be engaged. You know what? I want my kids a whole lot more than engaged. Engaged is being entertained. Engaged is watching MTV. Engaged is, you know, watching YouTube. Engagement doesn't equal education. I want my kids to be perplexed. I want my kids to wonder about problems. I want to give my kids problems that they care about, they're interested in, and they want to know. And what, if you can do that, then that solves so much of all the problems we, we sort of talk about in education, if we can just get to perplexing. Obviously, don't want them bored or confused, but perplexing is where it's at, not engaging. Which brings us to technology. So we've pumped a lot of technology into, uh, into schools over the last couple of years, you know, since um, Mr. Rudd announced his laptop program and we started putting laptops all over the place and, you know, there's iPads everywhere and Chromebooks everywhere and we're pumping all this stuff into schools. And I occasionally stop and ask myself, you know, has it actually changed anything? Are we doing anything really different? And in some cases the answer is yes. In a lot of cases it's not really. And if you start to think about what technology actually brings to education, I think, it raises a really interesting idea, and that is this idea of technology as a remover of friction. And by that I mean things that used to be hard can now be made far simpler. I've been teaching with technology for about well, over 20 years now, and things that we used to do in the classroom that were incredibly complicated, difficult, time-consuming um, are now easy. Uh, doing video conferencing 20 years ago was well, certainly possible, so you know, Google Hangouts and all that, that's not a new idea. Uh, the idea is that with technology in the process, you can actually make things far simpler than they used to be. I'll give you an example. When you took the friction away from the music business, when you made it easier for somebody to buy songs uh, and not have to go to a record store and, and you know, pay for a record and everything, uh, Dotty, uh, technology goes down, most of your kids can't work. I, I, I don't even entertain that, that sort of thing because that's, that's an edge case. Yeah, if the technology goes down, the kids can't work, I get that. But like that's an edge case. That's not something that happens all the time, or at least it shouldn't be. And if that's the sort of thing that is happening in the schools that you're working in, that needs to be fixed. Um, and you need to jump up and down until somebody fixes it. But that's, that's not where we should be focusing on, on technology and education about dealing with the worst case scenario of what happens if it doesn't work. Let's assume it works and let's do something with it. Um, so, yeah, when we took friction away from the music business, like, it just dramatically changed everything. Like, there are no record stores anymore. You can't, you can't, oh, there are almost no places you can go now and, and wander into a record store or, or buy CDs because they're all closed down. Because why would anyone buy music like that? Technology has allowed music to be distributed far simpler, cheaper, easier, faster. Now, it hasn't been people are less interested in music. People are probably listening and buying more music than ever, but they're simply not doing it through these channels, and that's what technology did to it. Uh, another example is the photography business. You know, you cannot buy a roll of film. Well, you probably can. Um, you probably can buy a film, but it's a specialist thing now. You know, the average person no longer shoots on film. And there was a lot of photography shops that, you know, this is a fad. This is never going to be, uh, this is never going to be, uh, you know, a long-standing thing. Film is still better. And of course, you know, that's just not the way the industry went. And a whole lot of places went out of business. Kodak went out of business, for goodness sake. Um, so that's when you take the friction out. People are shooting on digital instead of film. It just totally changed everything. What about video stores? Okay, Blockbuster just closed down its last few stores in the US, and probably around the world. I think they had, I think I read somewhere it was um, 70,000 stores at one stage, and they got down to like 400, and uh, recently just announced they were going to close those as well. So, you know, the idea of a video store. Um, kids being born today will not know what a video store was. 
And you have to ask the question then that what happens as friction is removed from education? And if technology can truly make some of the processes and the learning and everything simpler for, for what we're trying to achieve in schools, what does that do to the idea of school as we know it, the idea of education as we know it? And if you look around, you see, you know, you've all heard of the Khan Academy and you know, you know that MIT is doing open courseware and Code Academy, you can go and learn to code there. You can basically learn anything on TED. Uh, Lynda.com has lessons on just about everything you can imagine. There's iTunes, U, Coursera, Udacity, Code School. Like, there are tons of places now where you can learn that have nothing to do with school. And the truism is that an in a curious kid with an internet connection can learn anything they want. They actually don't need us nearly as much as we would like to think they do. I think we do. Okay, I think teachers are still bring a really valuable part. Uh, they have a really valuable uh, role to play in the learning process. But aside from that, you know, it is really true that that if if I'm a curious kid and I have a teacher who doesn't know what I would need to know, I don't need them. I can go around them. And uh, Shambles just mentioned the hole in the wall school and uh, Sagata Mitra's work. Um, you know, I think that's probably an extreme case about this, but, but I think it's really true that, that kids can learn anything if they want to. And all they really need now is an internet connection. So the role of the teacher changes. It's not that we're not necessary, it's just that our role in the process changes. And I think that you know, the way you look at that then is you know, don't confuse the container with the content. The container is school, but the content is learning. And too often we see learning and school as being more or less the same thing, and it really isn't. And so if we start to if we start to think that our job as teachers is about dealing with the school rather than the learning, then we actually sort of confuse the two things there, and we focus on the wrong things. Um, so questions then I want you to sort of consider as, as we sort of move out of this whole thing is, you know, how does the web change your classroom? How does the web change your school? How does it change your profession? How does it change your life? And the bigger question then is in the age of the internet, what exactly is your job? Is the job of a teacher as it once stood the same job? Is it a different job? Why? How has the internet changed that? And I'm going to come back to that quote that I started with right in the beginning from Seymour Papert there, you know, this idea of producing people who know how to act when they're faced with situations for which you are not specifically prepared. That, again, I think is really what we teachers should be doing, and that is that, you know, figuring out ways of allowing our kids to think in creative ways that allow them to expand outwards that aren't bound by uh, the limitations that we sometimes want to put around kids or that the school system sometimes put around kids. I'm sure we don't want to put it there, but the school system sometimes does. Um, that's, what we, that's what we need to do. That's, that's what we do. We, we prepare students for things that they're not prepared for. So just in the chat, just as we finish up there, if I had to get you to type one word, teaching today is what? Exciting, says Anne. A minefield, says Carol. Innovative, says Ness. Curious, says Ian. Challenging, says Janita. Yep, lifelong, inspiring. Some good words there. Some good words. Teaching today, I heard, you know, you probably heard it said that uh, teaching has never been harder than it is right now and at the same time teaching has never been easier than it is right now okay because learning has never been easier than it is right now it's um we live in a world where really learning is the currency that everyone now has access to it should not be it should not be a difficult thing anymore so you know you look at all this and you go you know, this is scary yeah maybe um, there's a lot of changes in education. There's a lot of things that need to change in education. Uh, it's scary. It's frustrating. Maybe sure, of course. But I can't help thinking that you know, if you're a real teacher, then how can you not be inspired by the possibilities of uh, of where we are right now in education, in learning? Um, it's an exciting time to be a teacher. Uh, and that's about all I got. So thanks very much for allowing me to ramble on to you guys. I appreciate the time. 
Well, I wouldn't call that rambling. I think that is inspirational, uplifting, and truly educational. You've allowed us the freedom to take it in different directions today. And I think you're finding that uh, most of the audience feel the same and lots more comments coming through. Uh, I'd like to hear from other people now. So I really want to open up the mic now and uh, tell us what you've been thinking whilst listening to Chris, what you've been doing while listen listening to Chris. So I'm going to drop the mic and let's start at the very top. Let's come over to Anne. No, Anne's away. Okay, we'll pop down to Ness. Over to you, Ness. Um, I, I don't know, I just, it's, it's a lot to take in. You know, everything that Chris was saying was, um, some of it, you know, you've heard a million times before, but there's something about how Chris has presented it that sort of makes you go, well, maybe I should think about that again. Um, yeah, I think that, I don't know, it's really inspirational. And just the way that Chris um, speaks, it's, it really makes you think, yeah, I am a teacher, and I love it, and it's awesome, and I can't wait to be there on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Now, that's what you want in a teacher, enthusiasm. So that's one word that we missed out, didn't we? We should have said enthusiastic. All right. Who can I pick on? Shambles. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was, actually, I'm going to pick on the last comment that was made about, not, not from Chris, the last comment about, I'm very enthusiastic. I'm glad to get up in the morning and go to work on Monday. And, and you're very, very lucky. Because I have this sneaking feeling that there's a lot of people in the world who get up in the morning and don't look forward to how they're going to spend the next eight or ten hours, and all they're doing is selling their time to an employer. I'm not talking about teachers necessarily there. Okay, so that's a, that sounds a bit down. On the upside, we couldn't be living in a more exciting time. How magical is it? We have uh, an evolution that would normally take several human lifetimes to go through, which has gone, we've gone through in less than a decade, and that's amazing. And the other, the other aspect of it, which I'm very excited about, is it's no longer K-12. It's no longer five years to 18 years old, or university if you want, tertiary. We are truly into the lifelong learning. And my, I bet money, but I always use mind you, I bet money that the majority of us in this room are doing things at the moment that weren't even invented or thought about when we were actually at, at school. And that's very exciting. There is a side where lots of people get very anxious and are tight about this and say, how can I keep up with it? How can I survive? What am I sub Teach me survival skills. I think they are just skills. And, uh, and for me, though, I really am excited that we're in an era of lifelong learning. It's really K to gray. Or as somebody told, so I suppose that's kindergarten to when your hair goes gray. I mentioned that once, and somebody said, no, no, I've got a better, a better thing to say than K to Gray. Excuse my language here, ladies and gentlemen, but the other, the other comparison was, it's lifelong learning from sperm to worm. I think I'll stop on that one. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Shamos. <laughs> Any comments about those from you, Chris? Uh, I love the sperm to worm thing. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, no, you're totally right. And and it is absolutely true that most of us who are, well, many people are doing things that were simply not around when they were born. Um, one of the frustrations that I see all the time is, you know, when people do do what they've always done. And they do simply just recycle what they did last year or they, you know, they, they use an excuse that, um, you know, I'll, I'll do what I did because that's the way it's always done. That's that's one of the things that I think gets up my nose more than anything else is that excuse when I hear from people. You know, never a good enough reason. We're getting some interesting um, 
comments coming through now. I, I'm sort of giggling at some of those things that um, people are sharing. I'm going to skip down to the bottom of the list of participants down at the other end of the alphabet. And I know Shingo is in a busy place, so I'm not going to pick on Shingo. I'm actually going to pick on Keith. Can you come and tell us something that you've been observing in your teaching world, some changes and how you're dealing with them? Well, for starters, I'm not at the bottom of the list. Um, I was thinking how to explain a, a what teachers, what I feel teachers should be doing, and uh, I'm always reminded of the book by Alvin Toffler on Future Shock, uh, where he wrote, I oh, damn near 40, 50 years ago, about the rate of change, and not only was change increasing, but the very rate of change was increasing, and teachers. Um, really need to be trying to future-proof uh, children so they can adapt to change. And I fully agree with uh, uh, what, what Chris said about, um, you know, we're going to keep doing it this way because that's the way we've always done it. And that's the very reason to turf it out and have a look at a new way of doing it. And, yeah. uh, and teaching no seniors is about that. It's um, uh, Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say Toffler's thing was always the learn, yeah. unlearn, and relearn. You know, so we have to be able to learn how to do something, and when it's no longer relevant, we have to unlearn what we used to know and then relearn a new way. Uh, and that, that's that's really and that's really what that's I'm talking right. about. The whole thing from um, from Seymour Papert, you know, about teaching people to prepare them for that world that doesn't exist and and to um, to know how to respond to things that they haven't been prepared for. You know, you've got to be able to unlearn the things that no yeah, longer work like and relearn in new ways. Yeah, I always like to quote to people uh, the words of uh, Eisenhower with the uh, the D-Day invasion, where his comment was that planning is everything, and the plan is worth nothing. Um, you know, if you think about what you're going to do, but then when when the event happens, you've you're far better equipped if you've got some knowledge and plan of what you you could have done or should have done, or, or other options that you can take, and you can uh, you can adapt to it better. But uh, yeah, seniors are struggling with it, and uh, and it's great to see the lights go on in an 80-year-old set of eyes when uh, they can search for something on the internet. Anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. It's all good. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, Shambles is being very cheeky in there. <laughs> um, I like hmm. the comments, though. So I'm going to give you uh, the last few minutes, Chris, to um, maybe you just want to sum up or, you know, tell us how could we best prepare ourselves for the changes that we don't even know are coming yet. So for me, I'm at the end of my teaching career and I probably don't need to worry about it, <laughs> so, but some might just be beginning. There's all kinds of new things coming up and, you know, for me, I keep thinking, well, there's certain attributes that you need to have in order to cope with change and I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts on that would be, Chris. Um, look, one of the most enlightening moments in my teaching career was when um, I had some students working on a project that uh, they were working with other students from around the world and they actually entered a sort of an, an online competition thing where they were working with teams across the world. This is 20 years ago, so again, not a new idea. And they actually won this internet competition. And when they when they went to um, to uh, collect their prize, which was in Hong Kong, so I got to fly to Hong Kong with a group of students and, and sort of have them awarded their prize, I asked them to write an acceptance speech. And the things they wrote in that acceptance speech um, just Every time I read them, I just get sort of emotional about the sorts of things these kids were saying about what learning meant to them. And I, I won't bother reading it to you right now unless you'd like me to, but what I took away from it was four things. And it made me realize that when I go into a classroom and teach kids, there are four things that matter. And one is I have to give them something to care about. I have to give them something to work on that, that actually matters, that matters to them. The second thing is I have to give them tools that allow them to do that. If I just if I get them excited about something or engaged or you know, enthusiastic about an idea, and I don't give them the tools to do that, then I'm shortchanging them. Um, the third thing is uh, um, push. Uh, <laughs> where is it? See, when you get on the spot like this, you forget things that you actually instinctively know. 
But it's, yeah, um, give them something that matters, give them tools to enable it. Um, the fourth thing is get out of their way. Sorry, let me find my thing. Here it's here. Um, is to get out of their way, you know? Like, we, we, we micromanage too much in education, I think. Uh, the third thing is give them choices. Sorry, make that number four. <laughs> third thing, give them choices. I worked with an amazing teacher once who helped me redesign. So I had a task that I was asking students to do, and I, I said, Mary, can you just help me with this? I'm not happy with the way this is going. And she just simply gave them more choices. And I went, oh, okay, that works. And and like I was doing a history task, I was getting kids to learn the history of something, um, and she said, "Be extreme about it. Give them give them tons of options about how they might respond to this thing. And so long as any of those responses can uh, prove to you that they've learnt the key ideas that matter, then it shouldn't matter what they do." So I had kids writing songs about this history of this thing. I had songs writing, the kids writing poems about it. I had other kids making movies about it. Other kids would sort of. Um, some kids chose to write an essay because that's what they like doing. Um, but the point is, if you give people lots and lots of options about how they express what it is they know, then that's one of the things that engages them. And the fourth thing is to get out of their way. Um, you know, so 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 they're the, the four things that sort of mat, made a difference to me. You know, give kids something to care about, give them the tools they need, give them choices in how they respond, and then get, get the hell out of their way and stop micromanaging everything they do. Uh, and that little simple four-step process has just always worked for me in, in schools. And me too. I love that last one because it was always part of my motto that you lead, you follow, and then you get out of the way. Thank you for yeah. summing up so eloquently. <laughs> and I just have a request of you. Could you please go back to your very first slide because I absolutely love that one. That was where we began with the conversation change. And the quick way to do that is if you do the drop down and then select your first slide rather than uh, go back through them one at a time. There we go. Uh, so the first one, there we go. I didn't know. Lovely. Oh, I just, right. <laughs> That's the one we want to finish on tonight because if you just take a really close look, look at the expressions on the faces about um, <laughs> conversations. And the body language, I think that's gorgeous. And the other reason for wanting it is I'm, I'm taking a few um, screenshots for my e-portfolio and I wanted that one. <laughs> All right, no thank you so much, Chris. Um, wonderful presentation tonight. And uh, if Anne is back in the room, she may, yes, you may want to just finalise the thank yous. So over to you, Anne. Um, thanks, Carol. Thank you, Chris. After our initial conversations, you made a fabulous closing note. Um, keynote speaker, I have loved the conversations. Often I think, you know, we should dump so much of what we do in the classroom, but your first few slides reminded me there's still a lot of good of what we do in there. Um, so thanks for motivating us, challenging us, sharing some wonderful pictures which I will have in my mind for many days and making us think. And hopefully these conversations for change will continue, both face to face and online. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Anne. Much appreciated. Fabulous. Thank you everybody for joining us. A uh, round of applause in the usual Blackboard Collaborate way is uh, coming your way now. And I'll now close the recording and I'll invite everybody to pop over to our after party, which is in a separate room. And we want to just have a bit of relaxation and uh, wind down and maybe in the meantime find something to bring to the table, virtual of course. The link of course I will post in there for you, one moment. Oh, I've lost my links. Uh-oh. Can someone please put the link in for the after party room? That will make it so easy. Thanks, Anne. Beautiful. All right. Head over there, folks, and we'll meet you there. And I'll close the recording now and thank everybody for being a part of our wonderful Aussie Live 2014. Thank you, one and all. <laughs>